the Alaska SharePoint User Group. Uh, this is the December 2015 meeting and my name is Greg Burke. And sitting with me today is uh, TJ Snell, who is a longtime SharePoint user. And uh, uh, today we are going to take a look at what I call secret weapons. And uh, it's not necessarily uh, anything destructive, it's just uh, people who actually know how to use uh, uh, Office with SharePoint and take it the extra mile. Uh, things that might not be obvious to the person who sees SharePoint as just a website. Uh, I'd like to thank my employer, uh, GCI and Network Business Systems, for giving us this meeting space and also the WebEx. Uh, and uh, a little bit about me, uh, my name is Greg Burns and I am a Network Systems Engineer. I'm working at uh, GCI. GCI recently acquired my um, uh, company, Network Business Systems, so we're sort of like a sub-group under GCI now. Um, I've been working with uh, Microsoft products since the beginning of my career. I'm a MCITP in SharePoint and uh, been working with SharePoint since 2001, since the, the product was released. And I've been working with SQL since version 7, way back in 1998. Uh, back then I was just uh, really kind of diving into using access databases on stuff. Oh, you can see our agenda is super simplified. I actually did not have time to finish these slides. Um, so I've, I've already introduced uh, TJ, and uh, my name is Greg Burns. And uh, today we are going to take a look at these things, among other things. I've actually got a few more things that are not on the slide. Uh, but the, they're, they are the secret weapons. You know, people often forget to take advantage of uh, the SharePoint client server capabilities, because you don't have to do everything in the browser. Um, you know, it's convenient to be able to, to use it to do everything in the browser. I mean, like if you are not at your desk, you can just walk into the site and access your stuff. Uh, you can use search. You can even, uh, you know, edit documents in the browser pretty, pretty uh, handily. Um, but uh, when you actually add a client to it, you get all kinds of really rich capabilities, you know, like being able to uh, manage your lists in Microsoft Access just like a, in a database. And you, you can do stuff like, you know, yes, even, even uh, create reports that, that use those lists as, their, as a data source. Um, you can write some really nice looking uh, blog posts on the thing you already use every day to, to write with, uh, which is Microsoft Word. Uh, and all you have to do is just click post and boom, uh, all your graphics and the layout are, are, uh, are uploaded um, and you don't need to be a web wizard to, to get it looking nice. Um, something that my team does here is uh, we use OneNote quite a bit. And, uh, you know, often I'll, I'll create a OneNote notebook for a customer for a project or something like that. But also uh, what we've done is we have uh, created a knowledge base. Um, so each tab is a different category and down the side you have pages which are um, uh, like different items uh, under that category. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, you can also use a SharePoint discussion list just like public folders. So if you remember back in the day, Outlook Express, uh, that was your Usenet client. That's, that's what you connected to the internet and, and uh, got onto, on, onto all those, uh, you know, Unix-based discussion boards. And something I miss about that is, is uh, you have all these threaded discussions, you know. Um, and uh, SharePoint also stores its content in the same way. And when you hook Outlook to it, uh, you get that, that same kind of experience. So we'll take a look at that. Um, so a little bit about client and server integration. Uh, the, uh, the Office team uh, designed SharePoint. And uh, up until, I guess, around about 2010, uh, it was owned by the, by the Office team. Um, well, that's not necessarily true. For, for a while, SharePoint was owned by the server group. And that's why you had uh, Windows SharePoint services used to be a feature of Windows that you could just install by checking a box. Um, and <laughs> they, they, they figured out in a hurry that that really wasn't that practical. Uh, so now SharePoint is its own um, product and uh, the, the Office and SharePoint team work very close together. So with every wave of uh, servers and products that comes out, uh, it's all really designed for each other. Uh, and so Office 2010 knows about SharePoint 2010 and vice versa. And the same thing with 2013. And, and, Sharepoint, and Office 2013 also knows quite a bit about op, uh, Office 365. Um, and so uh, what you would want to get is that seamless functionality. So if you open a document from a library, uh, Microsoft Word knows that it's a server document and it knows it's going to save back to that same library. It also knows about things like workflows and uh, if, if the library has extra columns in it, you know, metadata, tags, uh, 
uh, all that stuff comes down with the document and opens up in Word. So you will be able to, to, to edit those columns, edit those metadata uh, inside of Word. Um, and uh, so this, this integration actually is pretty specific. Um, first of all, it only works if you're using Internet Explorer. If you're using Firefox or Chrome or Safari or uh, you know, some other product, uh, what you'll get is just like a web 1.0 experience, right? Uh, that, that's not fair. Actually, the, the web experience is pretty good. It's just that um, the browser can't really look on your computer and see uh, what version of Office you have installed. Internet Explorer does have that capability. So when, when SharePoint opens, it's going to say, okay, what libraries do I have to work with? Oh, cool, you're running Office 2013. So I'll light up this button and this button and this button. And so now you have all these capabilities um, that uh, only uh, work if you have Office and uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, needless to say, it has to be the right version of Internet Explorer. I think, um, you know, depending on what uh, server product you got, I think uh, IE7 is for SharePoint 2010. And um, I'm not going to talk myself in a corner. I, I don't know exactly what they are, but uh, uh, I think almost everybody's running the latest version of Internet Explorer. So Internet Explorer 11 um, with uh, Office uh, 2010 or 2013. Um, and the site should be in the trusted or, or a local intranet zone. And that, that establishes a level of trust, kind of an elevated trust, that allows Office to talk back to SharePoint. Because uh, otherwise, uh, SharePoint is, uh, the, the Internet Explorer is going to intercept all that traffic and just reject it. And uh, then SharePoint is sad. Um, so uh, I usually put things on the local intranet zone. And um, just to digress a little bit, the, the, the difference between trusted and intranet, it really is uh, the, the login prompt. When you hit a site that's on the trusted zone, uh, you may or may not uh, see a login prompt saying, okay, who are you? And you have to you know, put in your credentials and put the domain in like, you know, uh, you know Contoso slash gburns and your password, which is a pain in the butt. Uh, the local intranet zone is even more relaxed. And what that's going to do is it's going to use your workstation credentials and automatically sign you into SharePoint. And SharePoint knows who you are, and so all of, all of your experience is based on your identity. Um, and Internet Explorer will try to detect this uh, by default, by looking at the address. If the address has any dots in it, you know, www.microsoft.com, it's going to say, oh, that's an internet site. So it's automatically not trusted. It treats it as an internet zone. Um, and uh, if it sees a, a address with one word, like let's say, you know, SharePoint, HTTP, black, black, SharePoint, it's going to say, oh, that's a server on my network. So I'll trust it. Uh, so it will automatically treat it as a local intranet site. Um, you can force the issue by going into Internet Explorer settings, go to the security tab, and then go to local intranet zones, and then add that site manually uh, into your list of uh, local intranet zones. Uh, and that will treat it as though it's local on your uh, network, and then um, everything will work uh, as, it's, as it's intended to. Hmm. Um, there, if you're an IT person, you can actually create a group policy that will automatically populate this list for all users. Interesting. Have you done that? Uh, no, we've been doing it manually oh. on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we had the whole, every time I pull up a document, we have to authenticate again, and that's when I found it. And was really happy to see that that stopped that behavior. Um, but I did not know that you could use a host name yeah. locally. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I used to, uh, I would create DNS names that were just like one word, like portal, HTTP portal, boom. And then um, uh, everything would just work at that point. Uh, but a lot of uh, you know, DNS purists, they want to use FQDNs for everything, and right. they, they would reject uh, an address like that, even if it was an internal site. Right. So, because uh, they don't want to use NetBIOS or Wins or anything like that. So, uh, if, if that's the case, then you can go in and create a, I will uh, share the link with you later, but there's, there's like a blog post that explains how to do this, um, what policies to affect. Uh, the one thing, the one detriment to that is that if you do that, um, if you create a policy, then nobody can edit their uh, local internet zone at all. Uh. <laughs> it's all grayed out for them because it's managed at, at, at the high, high level. Got it. 
So I, I was talking earlier, uh, whenever you load a SharePoint list or a library in your browser, SharePoint's going to detect what, what components you have on your computer and then it'll light up buttons in the ribbon. You know, for example, sync to SharePoint Workspace or connect to Outlook or open with Access. Or you can even actually use InfoPath to customize uh, a form that'll pop up. If you like, say, create a new item, it'll pop up with a, with a dialogue. You can actually replace that with an actual InfoPath form that's got like business logic and graphics and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it, it gets better with every version of Office. All right, so here we have um, a generic team site. Awesome. My uh, SharePoint server has not come up yet, I'm guessing. So here we have our generic uh, SharePoint site, and I've got my shared documents library. I've also created a couple of new ones called Important Docs and Classified Docs. Whenever you are in a document library, you go to the Library tab, you've got this button here that says Connect to Office. Now, I didn't, it, they don't really tell you what this actually means. You know, Add to SharePoint Sites, is that some list that actually is uh, stored in SharePoint, kind of a collection of shortcuts? That's what it actually meant in uh, SharePoint 2007. If you wanted to add a link, it would, it would put it into your own profile of, of you know, your own list of uh, shortcuts that followed you around on SharePoint, which wasn't really that useful. Uh, what this actually is going to do is it's going to add this library uh, as a shortcut into your open and save dialog. Uh, and so uh, if we go into Word here and I go to Open, I've got this, this new link here that's added whenever you create a, uh, when you say, you know, add, add a, uh, uh, an Office link. And it's going to add a shortcut here. So um, this technology actually does require SharePoint server. It doesn't work with the free version of SharePoint. Because what it's doing is it's talking to the user profile service. And the user profile service is uh, you know, kind of coordinating you know, this, this discussion. This is why if you, if you actually do add a link, it's not going to show up immediately because uh, it's got to go through that, that, that you know, round, round trip there. Um, You'll have to excuse my slow test environment here. Okay. So, um, what it looks like is uh, I can add to SharePoint sites. And oh, it's already in my SharePoint site. So, I'll, I'll go to manage my SharePoint sites. And here, uh, under my, uh, my site, I've got a list of all of the uh, libraries that I'm following. Okay, that's why it has to talk to the user profile service to be able to retrieve that list. Um, and uh, so let's go to the classified docs library. Come here to connect to office, add to SharePoint sites. It says library added. So I'll come back here and I want to do open. And if the stars are aligned, uh, it should pull down that new link. Uh, one thing I noticed is it's not immediate, and it also probably has to be, um, well, the service has to be warmed up. So if, server, if SharePoint has just started, then it won't necessarily uh, automatically show up, because when you click this link, it's sending a query back to your uh, my site. And so, yeah, it's coming in slowly. You can see the classified docs link has already showed up here. So that's something that uh, you might want to pass on to your users, is that you can actually create this list of shortcuts and save locations so you don't have to keep browsing to SharePoint. I used to think that you had to type in the URL to get to SharePoint. If you, if you, create, if you like created a new document on your desktop and you weren't, uh, it wasn't automatically associated with SharePoint, I thought, well, you get to type in the, the site name and it'll pull up a list and you can browse to the library. Um, this is an easier way to do it. And it, it actually makes it convenient for the user. So there's that. Um, questions? Okay. The only stupid questions when you didn't ask. 
All right, so as I said, it does require uh, SharePoint Server 2010, um, and the user profile service has to be provisioned. The next thing is SharePoint Workspace. Um, this is the successor to Microsoft Groove. And Groove 2007 actually did have this capability to you know, link up to a SharePoint site and pull down libraries and stuff like that, but it's really not obvious how to do it. And in 2010, they rebranded the whole thing as SharePoint Workspace. And so all the Groove stuff is still there, but it's in the background. Um, and uh, all, Workspace is one of those undersold, undersung um, uh, products that nobody really knew what it was for. I mean, they, they'd see it in their list of office products, SharePoint Workspace, what's that? Ugh. Um, and uh, it's also a little bit uh, intimidating because the first time you fire it up, it asks you to create a login. And you don't know what you're logging into because there's no reference. Really, all you have to do is just make up a name and an email address, and then it never asks you again. Uh, this is so that you could hook into Groove Server if you so desired. Um, but Groove Server has gone the way of the dodo. So uh, really, it's, it's just a matter of uh, typing in some bogus um, uh, uh, information. And then once it initializes, uh, then you are able to uh, create workspaces. Or you can uh, click on the button in the ribbon in a SharePoint library uh, saying uh, connect to SharePoint workspace. So um, what Microsoft said about this, that this is the ostensible client for a SharePoint 2010 site. Uh, because what you can do is you can take nearly, nearly every library offline. Um, you can also work on documents locally and they're, they're synced automatically in the background uh, to the site. And uh, does that sound familiar? But there's other products that do that now. Uh, and you can also work offline. You can fill out InfoPath forms and things like that. And when you're reconnected, all of your changes are synced, ideally. Uh, if, if there's a conflict, it'll actually pop up a conflict resolution wizard. So it's, it does it intelligently. It's not just pushing d uh, data to SharePoint and vice versa. Now, this is not a backup tool, correct? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, no, that's not what it's for. It's, uh, a, it's a sync tool. Yeah, and, and this is what we had happen was that we had a user that decided that they were going to use this to take copies of every single document in the site collection and store them locally on his machine. And every single day it was going through this sync process where his machine suddenly didn't work at all. So we removed this from his machine specifically because of that issue because it's well I mean like it, it's it's times. actually that that the worst thing about that is it probably gave him a false sense of security thinking right. he's backing it up right. if a document was deleted on the uh, site it'd be deleted on his desktop too but the way it should be used is that you're only taking offline those documents you would be working with yeah correct it's so you don't have to round trip to the server it's just so you can right. take your laptop on. that's right. really what it's for you know? yeah just sharing world experience because we did have that happen and IT troubleshot for a couple of days actually until they saw that running down there in the taskbar. And <laughs> like, what, what is that? Uh, yeah, it's kind of awesome. So don't download all the files. Okay. <laughs> Every tool has the ability to be misused. I mean, huh. that's just the way it is. Okay, so coming back here to SharePoint Workspace. All right, so you have this button in the library here. Let's actually go to a library that's got some stuff in it. Um, <clears throat> If I say that I want to sync to a SharePoint workspace, uh, what it's going to do, it's going to say, I already did it. Oh, let's try a new one here. Okay. All right. Uh, so the, the <laughs> I, I already ran this earlier to see if it would work um, because, you know, reasons. Uh, and um, so the, the scope of it is, the scope of this wizard is, uh, I have the ability to sync every single library on this site, okay? Um, which is good and bad, okay? Because you don't necessarily need um, you know, to sync the form template library to your computer, right? Or, or the links list to your computer. You could, um, and it's fine. Uh, and, and you can see that you have this explorer type view of every single item uh, on a site. So what I have locally is just this shared documents folder. And on the server, I have these other things that I could add uh, to this workspace. So I'll add the um, important docs. Uh, 
And so now, within a few seconds, important docs is uh, connected and synchronizing. Uh, you'll also see that uh, a lot of the business rules that are in the SharePoint library come down to the uh, client. So like this document here is checked out, so it's checked out also um, in the workspace. Meaning that if, I, if I'm not the person who checked it out, it's read only to me. Um, and I can do things like uh, check it out uh, through SharePoint workspace. going to send that command back to the site and uh, check it out on my behalf. Uh, again, apologies for the slowness of my test machine. Okay. Uh, questions? Or you already shared your horror story. Yes, don't let them download it all. <laughs> okay. Outside of that, we had a lot of success with it, so it was a good tool. It just, there's always that user. All right, so, um, the requirements for this, uh, you can actually use this with any, for any edition of SharePoint 2010, including the free edition. Uh, it does, SharePoint Workspace, the, the actual product, uh, only comes with, I think, uh, only comes with uh, Office 2010 Pro Plus, which is a little bit disappointing. I, I wish that they made some of these tools free, but that's not up to me. Uh, and uh, one thing you'll notice when, you're, when the wizard is running is that the, uh, there is a limitation of 10,000 files per workspace. So once you reach that threshold, it says I'm full. So you have to, you'd have to, I mean, so I guess it's not for a full site sync is, is the point. Or if you have a very large library, SharePoint workspace wouldn't be useful for that either because it would, it would cap out at 10,000. All right. So the next thing is, and this, this, you know, this is actually so obvious and I almost didn't talk about it, but it is one of those client server integration things that a lot of people, they don't necessarily know what that checkbox means. So I thought I'd talk about it. Uh, the local drafts folder, uh, when you have a library that has check-in and check-out enabled, um, you're, you're, you're offered this option to use your local drafts folder, uh, you know, which is to imply that what you're working with is a draft and not the you know, sole edition, you know, the sole version of, of the document. Um, so uh, what it's going to do is, is it gonna, it's going it's to save a copy of it to this uh, specified subfolder uh, on your computer. By default, it's going to be under my docs and it's called SharePoint Drafts. Um, and it's going to cache this offline copy of a document that you can you can you know edit to your heart's content while you're offline, and then when you sync back up, uh, uh, that that version is pushed back to SharePoint. And it does work similar to how SharePoint Workspace does, but there's no background sync. It only works when the document's actually being edited. So, uh, and I'll show you that. Were you familiar with that? So I'm going to go into my library here, and I am going to say require documents to be checked out. If I open this, oops. If I open it now, um, I can say check out and edit, and I have this option to use my Google Drafts folder. So I'll say OK. And this opens up in Word. But it also put it here under my my docs, under SharePoint Drafts. By the way, this is another thing that is cool about using Office with SharePoint, and that is the fact that you the there's a lot of stuff built into Word that interacts with SharePoint on your behalf. So this this check-in is actually sending a check-in back to the uh, SharePoint site and adding this comment uh, to the version history of the document. And you can see in the status bar down here that it's uh, you know, uploading to the server. And there will be a few other messages that flash by here. All right.
And you can see that after I checked it in, it removes it from uh, SharePoint drafts. Hmm. Okay. Um, so that's the 2010 stuff. And I think we'll move on now to the, to the stuff that really uh, does not require 2010. So let me freeze these machines. workstation running SharePoint sure, running Office 2013 and my SharePoint 2013 server. I was going to demo uh, Office 365, um, but I have to tell you, there's some stuff in there. It's changing all the time, <laughs> and so you know, as soon as I think I can demonstrate, it's like, oh, it's not working like I thought it would, and then I can feel like an idiot because uh, it's you know the, the the demo doesn't work. So. Um, I, I think the, uh, the demo that I'm going to show you is for the on-prem version of SharePoint and then these things may or may not work exactly the same in SharePoint Online. Uh, then again, uh, sometimes they, they change the way something works even if the feature is still there. Like for example, this is just an off the non sequitur here, uh, I have a Visio drawing um, that connects each shape to a uh, record to a row in an Excel spreadsheet, right? And actually the, the drawing of the SharePoint farm that I gave you, that, that's a data connected uh, SharePoint drawing. Right. You know, when you open the drawing, it, it doesn't necessarily need to refresh because all the data is there, you know, cached. Uh, but when you do a refresh, it's going to connect to SharePoint and access that Excel data and then pull it in and update all the shapes. Telling so, Power View. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a remote data source. Um, and uh, so I was putting together a demo to show the group that, right, it's kind of a video saying, hey, you can create these, these diagrams and it's really easy. And I couldn't get it to refresh. It would not refresh. On-prem, it works just fine, one for one. As soon as you click refresh, it opens that, that, that connection. But online, you're sharing a server with hundreds of other people, right? right. And so everything is... Uh, and I, I believe what's going on is that I did a refresh and all that, that and that, that there was a cache, right? And as soon as that cache expired, it would do another uh, pull. But um, for for my, for my purposes, a, a live refresh just didn't work. So uh, things like that, things that make sense when you think about okay, economies of scale, they they have to do things that way. Um, uh, so that that's how Office 365 is is uh, significantly different from SharePoint 2013. All right, so we're up and running here. That question was asked at the uh, SP TechCon about whether or not admins were going to be given more notice about these changes, and basically the short answer was no. And they were very <laughs> unapologetic about doing so. Yeah, they said use Azure. If you want full control, use Azure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One thing I like about Windows 8 is that you can use your like Windows Live login, uh, and it works just it works perfectly in almost all circumstances. Um, but I'm logging in as a, as my test domain user here uh, rather than my Windows Live account because of that trust issue that that you know Greg Burns uh, is not necessarily part of the Hyper-V domain, and so I, I always get a login prompt whenever I hit anything. Um, so. All right, well, that's cooking. I'll go to my next slide here. So the next few slides are going to be for products and techniques that work essentially the same in all the versions of SharePoint and all the versions of Office. Um, I mean, there, there's some differences, but the, the base capability is, is the same. Um, and uh, the first thing, <laughs> all these slides are actually for SharePoint 2010, but um, let's say you've got a custom list that you want to use for storing passwords, right? Um, you create your list. Let's say you've got the, you know, the username and the password field and, and the, uh, the, the effective date and all that kind of stuff. You want to manage this and access. 
So you click on Open with Access and a dialog pops up here saying, okay, do you want to link your data to the SharePoint site or do you want to export a copy to work with locally? And it's also going to create an Access database file uh, on your machine that you can open up and it'll, it'll keep that connection alive. Um, and so uh, uh, now you have a table uh, that's in Access that you can use to um, uh, manage your passwords. All these passwords are bogus, by the way. There's no system that I manage that uses these passwords. <laughs> They're completely made up for this demo, just so you know. <laughs> uh, so let's take a look at that. So in this example, I've got a, a, a list called servers, right? And I come to the, the ribbon here, and I've got this, this button here that's lit up, right? Um, and by the way, you see that there's some, some items that are grayed out. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily that you know, the Outlook isn't working or that you know, my, my Microsoft project uh, uh, application isn't working. Uh, they use a standard ribbon for, for all libraries, and so they, they just gray out the stuff that doesn't apply. So uh, what you'll see later if I go to project tasks, uh, the project button actually is lit up. So um, if I want to open this with access, it's going to pop up and say, all right, we will create an uh, a access database file named servers. And I'll say OK. By the way, uh, when I was doing this logged in as a different user, my, my Windows Live account, uh, it locked up at this point. Um, and I have to believe that it's just because the authentication wasn't happening um, you know, in the way that it expected. Um, so if I open this, this table up, you can see that now I have this rapid uh, uh, way to edit all this data, right? I can look at actually uh, the schema of the table and see, you know, what, what the data type is of each of these fields. It, it, it is a, a linked table, so I can't change any of this stuff here, uh, but it's telling me what, what actually all the data types are. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then, of course, uh, since all these things are represented as local objects, I could create a report in my Access client to, that, that would use uh, all of these linked tables as data sources, which I think uh, is probably pretty useful. You know, that is you, the only way I've found to print really usable reports out of SharePoint with larger amounts of data is using the Access. It's kind of basically a print driver. Yeah, well, uh, SQL reporting services can do the same thing. Uh, it's not as straightforward, uh, but you, you have much more power because all the, you know, the, the engine is there in SharePoint. You don't need to, to involve to just your write access. queries and then have yeah. them formatted. Yeah, you, you basically set up your data sources and you design a report and the data sources are connected and, and refreshed. We'll have to talk about that on another day. Yeah. All right, so going back. It's really the only complaint that I get pretty regularly is when you print it just looks so icky. The when you what? The when you print it just doesn't look nice. You know, That's printing true. a list. Uh, okay, so as far as that goes, if you want if you wanted to print like a list, um, there is a, an add-in from Bamboo uh, that okay. will format a, a list or you know, page uh, for, for printing. Uh, also, I think you can export PDF uh, with that same component. Uh, I haven't used it myself. I, w I went shopping for this because another customer complained about exactly the same thing. Right. And they said, I'm not paying that much money for that. But the, 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 you know, the thing is, I mean, SharePoint isn't perfect out of box, so that's what all these third-party vendors do. Right. All right, so using Microsoft Word to create posts. Um, and uh, you have the ability to create a post right in the, right in the browser, but uh, on Word, there's a template called a blog post that you can use um, to you know, create uh, you know, a nice layout and uh, embed graphics and uh, things like that. And so um, when you save it, all of your pictures are also automatically uploaded to the uh, correct library. And you can also, I, I've done this for our internal SharePoint 2010 site, um, you can e email enable the posts library. So that, um, like let's say I, I write an email, the body of the email becomes the body of the post. Very nice. And uh, that makes it really easy to contribute to a, to a blog. And the only difference is that if you have any graphics in your email, they will not be uh, brought into SharePoint. Your SharePoint has no idea. 
Um, so, just taking a look at that. Uh, this I have actually not um, set up, but it should not take too long to do. So I will add an app. Okay, I think for 2013, you actually have to create a site using the blog template. that my, my slow test environment is not. Embarrass me. So while that's cooking, I will, oh, there we go. So now I go to Word, and I am going to choose the blog post template, okay? And so, um, uh, it wants you to register with the site so that it basically it's going to cache your credentials and connect automatically uh, so you don't need to worry about it uh, that often. Okay, so I, I will register now and you can see that Word actually can be used with a lot of different blog uh, services out there. Um, but I'm going to use a SharePoint blog and say next and the URL is one slash log. There's a warning saying that uh, if you have any information, it's going to be visible to other people when the broadcast progresses in the net. Okay, so I will say my very first post, and I will say. That's all the Latin I know. And um, I can publish it as a draft or just go ahead and publish it. So click yes. And it says the post was published to blog at that time. I come back here and there she is. Oh, that's too sweet. Yeah, I like it. You can also do things like uh, add categories. And so uh, if I come back to Word here, it should be categories. Um, and I can type in a new one or pick pick an existing one. So I can say this is pressing TJ. And now it's been republished. Now one thing to remember is it's not saving it on your computer. What I usually do though is I click the save button and I'm going to save it to my desktop for example. And I'll say uh, That way I've got a local copy of that post in case I wanted to post it elsewhere or just keep it for my own vanity. Um, and this uh, keyword, this, this category that I added to it, uh, oh, this one here. Um, this, this category, Impressing TJ, is now a search keyword. So if I wanted to search for that, uh, everything is tagged with it, again, becomes uh, relevant. So basically your hashtag. Yeah. All right, so come back to PowerPoint. Uh, I'm going to be a little brief on the OneNote stuff. Um, so I use OneNote for my tech notes, right? And uh, you know, I don't really have a customer named Prudy Clintons, uh, but if I did, this is what I would do. I've got like uh, customers across the top and I've got uh, each visit down the side here. And then uh, all, all my notes are in a table with two columns. I got the timestamp and, and the, uh, the web column and the, you know, the, the event uh, in, the, uh, in the right column. Uh, what I like about it is that you get built-in search. It doesn't rely on SharePoint or anything like that. Uh, it also OCRs uh, all the graphics. 
okay? Uh, and then uh, the other cool thing is that when you publish a, sh a OneNote notebook to a SharePoint site, you get this really nice experience um, with, with your pages uh, because you can edit them uh, basically you know, w w using WYSIWYG, right? As, as you're typing, you, you get uh, the, the, the full editing capabilities. Again, it's not as rich as, as, as the full Office client, but uh, it is uh, pretty handy. So like if I am at a customer site and I don't have my laptop or my laptop's not allowed to be on the network, uh, I could open my OneNote notebook through the browser on, on a customer computer and update my, update my notes that way. Um, and then uh, SharePoint Search also is going to index uh, these, these uh, OneNote files. So um, the mobile app works great too. It does, doesn't it? Yes, yes it is very nice. All right, so we talked about using discussion lists in Outlook. Um, and uh, Exchange public folders are you know, supposedly uh, dead and dead and gone now. Uh, Microsoft had originally said you should migrate all of your email to document libraries, and actually that's a really impractical thing. Um, migrating them to document libraries treats them like files. They're no longer like messages or just MSG files that you can open up and say, hmm, okay. Uh, but what people want is uh, they want the, uh, the conversation view of, of these uh, emails. They can see what actually what, what the outcome was. Um, so as I was saying, the, the document libraries don't work like public folders, but discussion lists have the most in common. Hmm. Um, here's another demo I haven't tried yet. So if we go into discussions, go to the list, I can connect this to Outlook. <laughs> nice. Hopefully this is going to work. Okay, so this, this dialogue you're saying, yeah, only do this with the uh, site you trust, that's fine. And so now I have this discussions uh, thread here uh, in the same uh, navigation as my, as my other thing. I, and, and all these items are now treated as posts. So I can do, what I can do is I can drag things out of my inbox into this discussion thread and that information is stored up in SharePoint <laughs> and accessible in, in Outlook. So that beats the heck out of a PST, huh? Yeah, that's nice. Okay, uh, so I obviously I'm not connected to the internet or any mail, so I can't really demonstrate it. But if I create a post here, I can say um, this is my important topic. Okay. And that should be synchronized back to SharePoint. And I can reply here. I come back. Uh, whenever send receive happens, it should pull that stuff down. Wow, that's slick. And you can see it's threaded. I see better now why I've been encouraged on a bunch of different um, boards to use a discussion group for our help desk application. Now it makes more sense. Yeah, it's pretty handy. Right? So is that Crow Canyon uh, working for you guys? No, I'm getting rid of it as quickly as I can. That was that was uh, yeah that was the previous previous IT manager. She went down her own road. So, not that there's anything wrong with Crow Canyon, but it wasn't working for us. Not everything's a good fit. No, I found that SharePoint 2013 has added the tools that I needed to do all the things that Crow Canyon was allowing us to do. So, minus the printing. They did have a print driver in there that was useful from time to time. 
Wow, that was weird. Okay. So, almost done here. Okay, I don't have a slide for this, but let's go ahead and demonstrate it. This is uh, using project to manage tasks in SharePoint. So I've got a project task list here, and this, as you can probably see, is my preparations for Thanksgiving, right? Um, which is handy. Uh, so I can go ahead and open this with project. Have you worked with the task list at all in, um, uh, in SharePoint? Uh, yeah, I actually was using it to try to put together a, a new help desk application. Excuse me. Based on a list, and then creates the tasks, and you can see that Microsoft is very unhappy that I've not activated the project yet. <laughs> okay, so um, what I like about this is that um, pretty I've much everything you're using. What's that? I've not used project. Oh, though, so okay. this is new. Well, behold. Um, da -da 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 -da. What I like about it is the ability to create all these uh, dependencies, right? Um, and really in a flat task list, you don't get that kind of, you know, interaction. Right. Um, wow, my computer is really unhappy. <laughs> I think I have too many things running. Um, all right. So uh, I did some modifications here. I'm going to click Save, and you can see that it will sync back to SharePoint. Or my VM will freeze. <laughs> so. What it's supposed to do, and what it did this morning when I when I tested it, is um, this: all these items are are, are linked to uh, identical tasks in SharePoint, and uh, the uh, the view that you get of these items, uh, you can put it into a Gantt view, um, you can put it into a timeline view, um, you can set. Uh, dependencies. You can you can assign resources that are in SharePoint. Like you know, if you have uh, your your IT guys, you, know, you want to assign them these tasks. Uh, all these tasks in SharePoint roll up. Uh, they're aggregated. Uh, so like if you have you know your help desk site and your HR site and your um, payroll site, there's a task list on each of them, and each one of those uh, groups assigns you a task. It actually rolls up and goes to your my site. Um, and under under your my site. See if it's come back yet. No, it's gone. Ah, man. So you have a centralized location. Yeah. So oh. which what you get is is uh, uh, you go to your my site, your news feed, right? And and down the side you have like uh, my blog, and, and down the bottom says my tasks. So you click that, and each one of the of the uh, tasks is grouped under the site where it belongs to. Um, and if you have Exchange 2013, you can actually link that to Exchange, and those tasks show up in your inbox. Uh, when it went over your site, which may or may not be a good thing. <laughs> I'm having all these people assigning you tasks from all, their, all over their company. Uh, so uh, that, that doesn't suck. Uh, I think that using project to manage your tasks is, is, is a lot more fun than doing everything in the browser because, again, you get that rapid edit capability you know, right. uh, when your VM doesn't freeze. So um, that's all I have time to show. I mean, there, there's a few more things. Um, Obviously, uh, uh, it's an evolving product, and um, the next version of uh, SharePoint, it's SharePoint 2016, uh, supports this thing called groups. Um, groups are only available to the um, the subscription, not not the like the E1 folks, but the people who actually subscribe, you know, individually to SharePoint or to Office 365. Um, and it's sort of like how group works, right? You, you have this, this group of people that are not necessarily tied together uh, by uh, an organization. And they all contribute. They have a shared mailbox. They have a shared library. And uh, uh, the Office uh, 2016 has that capability built in. It just, just lights up in the ribbon, uh, the, the group uh, commands, mm -hmm. things like that. So there's a lot of uh, 
uh, it, they're, they're continually trying to, to trying to evolve the uh, way people do things with Office and uh, with the cloud. Uh, and it's pretty exciting to see where that's headed. So they didn't include that in the on-prem Uber from September? Not that I could see, no. That would be too useful. Yeah. I, I think what they focused on primarily with SharePoint 2016 is scale. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the improvements there are you know, amazing if you're, if you're an IT admin, right? right. Um, but they're, they're sort of like, hmm, that's okay. I mean, like, uh, you can now upload 10 gigabyte files, you know. There used to be a, a hard limitation uh, of two gigabytes because of the way IIS worked, right? IIS could only handle a two gigabyte file. And now they're using bits. So bits, hmm. uh, that, that transfer technology uh, allows you to upload things a lot faster, um, and it's, uh, the, the, the size limit is 10 gigs. So you really could start using SharePoint like a file server, you know, rather than just a, a website with big uh, ambitions, you know. Um, so that's all I have for today. Do you have any uh, questions? No, actually, uh, my communications coordinator is gonna love the blog thing, the, the ability to post directly to both our WordPress, because I saw WordPress listed there as well, and our, our SharePoint. That's pretty nifty. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I can't vouch for WordPress specifically, but uh, I know it works pretty well with SharePoint. The less you got to use a browser, the better. Now, I've heard uh, what a lot of people like is the free, um, there's the, under the Microsoft Essentials, there is a, like a live writer, I think they call it. That also is uh, pretty handy. It does sort of the same thing. Uh, so I might, might check that out if you don't want to pay for Word. You can use a library. All right, well, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, we'll see you next time.